Hey everyone, my name is Mike Sipos and I'm the UF IFAS Extension Florida Sea Grant Agent in Collier County. And today we're going to fillet one of my favorite fish to catch and eat. Um, it is equally as pretty as it is delicious, the yellowtail snapper. So if you watch the video, you'll get to learn more about this fish. If you read the description, you're going to learn more about the biology. I include a lot of information in there that I can't include in the video because I, I can't make the video super long. And uh, if you'll please take the survey in the link uh, below, that will be greatly appreciated. Helps us justify the time and effort it takes to create these videos and my personal time to go out there and catch them. Um, so, yep, I'm going to go ahead and move the camera closer to my hand so you can get a good look at what I'm doing and we'll get started. Okay guys, so let's get started. So this is our beautiful yellowtail snapper right here. So to give you an idea for scale, this fish weighs 3.7 pounds, has a fork length of 18 and a quarter inches, which is measured right there. And then a maximum total length, which is a pinch tail measurement of 22 and uh, three quarter inches. And this fish, despite it's like heavily forked tail, which a lot of species for regulations are usually measured at the fork, when they have this kind of feature, um, is still maximum total length measurement, so that pinch tail measurement, if you're looking for regulatory information. But in terms of misidentifying this fish, you're not really gonna do that, because there's nothing that really looks like them. They're super pretty. They got this brilliant yellow tail that goes all the way up to their eye. Their patterning is really unique. Uh, the only other fish that I could think of that you might be able to mistake this for would be maybe like a rainbow runner. But a rainbow runner is going to be more cylindrical, smoother, not very scaly, but they do have a bright yellow fork tail that these have. And they sort of inhabit the same um, pelagic area, semi-pelagic area around reefs and wrecks. Um, but yeah, this, this fish is pretty unique and pretty cool. So it's in that Lujanidae family, which is all snappers or most snappers. So that's about 113 species in that family. But uh, the, the scientific name of this fish is Osiris chrysis, uh, <laughs> chrysis. Sorry for that butchering over there. But um, yeah, they're the only member of the species in that genus. So that makes them super unique. And uh, the, la uh, the, the scientific name comes from Greek, which uh, okis means quick, and then uh, aura means tail. Um, so quick tail, and then that, that chryso means golden. So uh, quick tail golden, which is a great accurate representation of this fish. They're pretty quick. They uh, you know have this brilliant yellow tail. And um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started filleting them, and I'll pepper in some more facts during that process. So. There's not really much to this fish. They're probably one of the easier ones to fillet. If anything, uh, the, the difficult part will be that they, they could be a little bit mushier. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're, you're chilling them down pretty good before you start filleting. Um, you know, I actually, uh, the, it, it's been sitting for a couple minutes um, <laughs> because uh, I was setting up the video, but yeah, make sure it's nice and firm and let's get started cutting it. So I'm gonna use this dorsal uh, fin as a guide going all the way up to the head portion and going all the way back down. So this fish is uh, sort of has that characteristic distribution of that Western Atlantic uh, from Massachusetts to Brazil, but they're really common in like the, the Caribbean, South Florida uh, area. They inhabit a lot of reefs and wrecks and uh, they're semi-pelagic, so they're associated with the bottom, but more so they're swimming up in the water column and they're really heavily schooling fish. So uh, you will see usually a couple of them instead of one. So I made that cut really from that, that head portion where it starts getting hard, feeling around there, feeling around the gill plate. And once it gets soft, you could actually start your initial cut going down. Um, so the IGFA world record for this fish, they could get pretty large, was actually caught um, off the coast of Fort Myers, Naples area. And that was a 10.19 pound yellowtail. So think about a yellow tail that's almost three times bigger than this. That's a, that's a beast. But they're super fun to catch. Um, a, a lot of times the strategy to catch these is using chum and uh, it gets pretty exciting when there's a bunch of them schooling in the back and you can pitch your bait at them and catch one. Um, a lot of times these fish actually uh, eat nocturnally. Um, they're like, like a lot of snappers do. 
and they'll eat a lot of uh, crustaceans, plankton when they're smaller, um, fish, squid, and other invertebrates like that. So I'm going to make that similar cut along the back. Uh, like I said, it's pretty simple to fillet this thing. Uh, they don't really have too many bones that you need to like cut around and if they do have them you can sort of cut through them and then remove them in the fillet later. And I'll feel that hard portion, stick my knife there and then make my cut. They can be found in anywhere from like 600 feet to you know inshore just depending on where you're, you're, fi you're fishing. Um, if you're in the more sort of Caribbean tropical areas, you'll, you could find them, you know, right off of a dock a lot of the times. Oh, and that's actually a male because you can see that milt right over there. Uh, but if you're in more of a temperate area, they're going to be in more sort of stable conditions around those reefs and wrecks in your area. But they're, they're really characteristic and uh, iconic in the Keys, where if you go to any of those uh, marine protected areas, like the lighthouses out there in the water, like Alligator Reef, um, you'll find some really big yellowtail there. And they're really fun to swim around because they're pretty. So I'm skimming that backbone, cut in around the ribs. And lifting the fillet as I'm pointing my knife tip down, trying to make that noise. That, no, that means that you're getting the most fillet off as you can. And I cut down like this, and then over. And there we have it, there's our other fillet. I'm gonna scoot him off to the side and show you how to skin them. So the, the max age of this fish, they actually found that out in uh, CDAR 64, and uh, yellowtail can live up to 28 years, which is a pretty long lifespan, but they mature at around nine to 12 inches, which correlates to about three or four years old. Um, I'm gonna bring that fillet to the edge, hover my knife, you know, maybe a couple millimeters from the skin, doing that sawing pulling motion. Uh, when they spawn, they could actually spawn year round just depending on where they're, they're living. Like with that such big range, it could be dependent on temperature and season, but they do have peak spawning times during the warmer months. So in this area, that would probably be around uh, April to August. And uh, they're batch spawners, so they could you know sort of spawn multiple times in a season. And every time they spawn, they can lay anywhere from uh, a, a th 100,000 to 1 1.5 million eggs, just depending on the size of the female. So the amount of eggs that a female produces isn't correlated to the size in terms of the double the size of the fish, double the eggs. It, it's exponential. So a smaller female will you know, produce maybe that 100,000 range, while a female maybe a couple, th a couple inches longer will, will, will produce uh, hundreds of thousands of more eggs. And, uh, that little is known about sort of the pelagic larval duration of this fish in terms of uh, like, 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 a, like in the wild, but I actually found a paper where they started re raising these in captivity and they found within about, uh, I think it was 60, 60 days or so that they began to have uh, adult coloration and Within about uh, a centimeter in length, they sort of settle out of the water column uh, as from like a planktonic stage to like more of a kind of fish stage. And within that 14 millimeters, I believe, that's when they began to get some of their pigmentation to match that beautiful adult coloration that you see, like almost like, like really sunset looking kind of fish. So I removed the, the bloodline there and the Y bones. And I'll go ahead and do that to the other portion of the fillet. You could use your finger a lot of times to see if there's any remaining bones that you could cut out. Over here I have that fillet portion. Here's a little bit of that rib meat I'm going to cut out. And then feel for that Y bone here. Cut along either side of it. And you can sort of cut along the, the length of that if you want to remove that whole entire bloodline. You can eat the bloodline, but I uh, prefer to remove that from my fish. So the fillet is actually getting a little bit warmer, so it's, it's starting to 
tear a little bit more, but if your fish is rock solid, cold, it, it's a little easier there. Uh, here's our two portions of the filet. And that's it. So I've never actually removed the otoliths of these fish. The otoliths are the ear stones inside that are used to age a lot of fish species. I'm going to go ahead and try for the first time here. Um, the way I usually do most fish is I, I try to find this first gill plate area. Uh, this is the operculum. There's a notch right there and I use that as a guide. And I'll use a serrated knife. You could use a hacksaw. With larger species you could use like a jigsaw or sawzall. But you sort of cut down, make sure you're super careful. Fish are slimy, you know, that you're using a knife. And uh, make that cut down until you hear a sound change. And when you hear that sound change, you could sort of tweak the knife, go like this, crack that cavity open, and uh, start your digging. Cut down deep enough, but let's see what we got. So I am in the right area. I can see the, the tubes of that inner ear canal area, but it looks like I'm a little bit further back, so I might need to cut forward, but that might reduce my ability to find these things. Oh, I hear them though. So these otoliths are actually made out of calcium carbonate, so it's not really bone as much as it is stone. So if you're in the right area and you start hearing a little bit of like, almost sounds like your tweezers are hitting glass, um, that means that you have the otoliths. So I am feeling them. So a good tip for you guys if you try to do this at home is actually to, to cut a little bit forward from that front gill plate in order to get that out. So I'm gonna have to get a little bit creative for this one. And cut along the top. Oh, there they are. <laughs> okay. So there's one otolith here. It's actually a pretty large one. I was thinking since it would be more of a pelagic species or semi-pelagic species, it would be smaller because that usually is a trend. More benthic or fish that are associated with the, the bottom have larger otoliths. Um, they function similar to our inner ear to give you sort of spatial orientation, acceleration, all that good stuff. I got that one, and there needs to be a matching one on the other side, but I am really far back. Okay, so it took me a minute, but I finally got the second one out, and um, there it is. So let's go ahead and get both of them next to each other so you guys can see. And those are the otoliths, or those ear stones that are used to uh, help age the fish. There we go. So uh, thanks for watching. Uh, be sure to check out the, the description for more information about the Yellowtail Snapper. And um, yeah, please answer the survey that, in the link below to tell us what we can do different. And uh, thanks so much. Bye, guys.